is this Jesus, son of God, son of man? His words prevail around the globe, spanning centuries, cities, knowing no sphere of influence? He needed no platform for his words to gain notice. He's the most influential, controversial figure to have ever walked the earth, the most interesting man to ever live and die and live again. Why is he so talked about, so sought after, so loved, yet so disliked? And how does his life impact your life? As we look back at the life and words of Jesus, we'll discover the life that we were designed to live. Hello, City First Church family. How are we all doing today? Yeah? It is good, good, good to see all y'all. And I just want to say hello to City First anywhere. Everyone join us online. Cape Coral, Southwest Florida. Come on, give it up for Dixon and Hardy, God Behind Bars. And obviously all you here at the uh, Spring Creek and Saline location. You know, we're in this series called Vintage Jesus. And we're all asking this question, who was and who is Jesus? Because arguably he's the most dynamic person to ever walk the face of the earth. You know, he grew up with no news outlets, no social media, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, any of those ways to promote himself, and yet he has become the biggest influencer in the last 2,000 years. And Billions of people have followed him and are following him, and he is the most famous talked about person. So, you know, I said last week people try to cancel him. Uh, there have been whole empires that have tried to erase him, eliminate his word, but all of them have failed, and still his movement continues to grow and grow and grow every year. So I'm asking the question, who is this Jesus in this series because he created us and he knows the best way for us to live and he knows how uh, to lead us and guide us so that we can have a life that is approved by God and I said last week the best way to understand him is to basically look at his words look at his actions and to listen to his stories that he would tell and these stories are called parables. And these are sermons, you could say, but inside of these stories, there are these life-changing, powerful principles that uh, help us understand the kingdom of God and how we are to live and make choices. So, um, you know, today I want to start off with this idea. I've discovered the older I get that the older I get, the more clarity you get when you get closer to people, situations, or circumstances. What I mean by that is this, is recently I found myself connecting with uh, an individual, a friend, that we hadn't talked for a long time, and in that conversation, I realized something, that in life, many times when you don't see somebody for a long period of time or don't talk to somebody for a long period of time, you can begin to create false narratives and weirdness can just kind of naturally enter the relationship, right? Like, especially when you text somebody. And they don't text you back right away. You start thinking to yourself, okay, what's going on here? What's the deal? Like I texted you, you didn't text me back. Or, or maybe for some of you that you still leave voicemails, right? And you leave a voicemail and they don't get back to you right away. And you're thinking, what the heck? What's going on here? You know, you, you get a little bit put off by it. Or, or maybe you do talk to them on the phone. And when you're talking to them on the phone, their tone is just a little bit different. Now, they may have a throbbing headache, and you don't know about that, but you hang up the phone, and you're thinking, what's the deal? I mean, why did they act that way? Why are they, why are they kind of like, you know, throwing that vibe at me or whatever? And you begin to ask yourself, is there something wrong? Is, is there weirdness between us? Did I offend them? Should I be offended by them, you know? And all of this is because there is distance. And I would start off today by saying this, that distance creates distortion in every area of life. Like, if you are distant from somebody, if you're distant from a situation, if you're distant from a circumstance, it just creates distortion. 
And, and we feel this way because if there is distance there, it, it's like we kind of see through kind of like, like kind of a foggy lens, you could say. Well, if distance can create distortion, then I believe closeness can bring clarity. Closeness can bring clarity. Today's story is all about closeness bringing clarity because if distance can create distortion, it also can create a misperception of what's true. And, and so, you know, when you're distanced from somebody or a situation, um, you, you can create these false narratives and these theories and these assumptions about the other person that maybe are completely false, but you kind of buy into it, right? And you, they, they become your reality. And that's what we want to talk about today because we want to talk about the fact that this distance many times can create a distortion and a false Reality. So today's, um, today's talk is all about closeness, like creating a, a clarity. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn them open to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. We're going to talk about a parable here that is actually one of my favorites. It's also, I'm just going to prepare you, it's also one of those ones that Jesus steps on our toes, all right? So you might want to, if you're sitting there in our auditoriums or maybe even in your living room, just kind of tuck your toes a little bit under your seat for a second here, because um, Jesus kind of, he brings it today, you could say. He brings it in Luke 16, starting in verse 19, it says this, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who was feasting sumptuously every day. Now, I want to stop there for a moment. A rich man clothed in purple. This was very, very rare in Jesus' day. Some of you have heard me talk about this before. But you know what? Very rare, not because people didn't like the color purple, but because the purple dye was so rare and so expensive to make that only the elite and the very, very, very rich had garments made of purple. Now I'm talking rich, not like I drive a Porsche and I have a Louis Vuitton purse. I'm talking a much greater level of being rich. I'm talking kind of an Elon Musk kind of level of being rich. So rich, you don't even count all your money kind of rich. Those were the kind of people that wore purple back in the day. Or the other type of person that wore purple were people who had status, like they had power. Like in Jesus' day, a person who would wear purple would be like Caesar, the emperor of Rome. Does that make sense? Like he would wear purple. So would like the high priest of Jerusalem and Israel. Because again, status-wise, they would have purple garments. Like Pilate, we learned about Pilate during like the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. Pilate was a governor. He was not rich enough, nor did he have the status to wear purple. So I'm, I'm kind of framing here the kind of rich man that Jesus is talking about in this story. This is kind of like a, a level of power that even those that were powerful would look to and go, oh wow, that's pretty amazing. So Jesus paints this rich man as being very rich, very powerful. It says this, at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. So Jesus is telling a story, and outside of this very rich man's mansion, at the edge of his property, there was probably a gate and a wall that kept everyone out, and outside of that gate laid a poor man by the name of Lazarus. Now, if you are listening to this story in Jesus' day, you are immediately confused by this. And here's the reason why. Jesus says that the man, the poor man, Lazarus, has sores. Well, most likely that means that he was a leper. And leprosy was very, very common in Jesus' day. In fact, if you had leprosy, you were not even allowed in the city. The cities of that day had walls themselves. And so the lepers would form colonies, leper colonies, outside of the city. They were kicked out of the city, outside of the city walls. And they would actually beg at the city gates as people were coming in and out of the city for money. That's how they made a living. And if you were approach a leper, they were obligated to say to you, unclean, unclean. 
They had to say it. They had to go unclean, unclean as you were approaching. Because what they had to tell you is, they said they had a contagious disease, leprosy, and so they had to announce that they were unclean. And so what would confuse Jesus' listeners to this parable is why is this leper inside of the city? Should have been outside the city. And not only that, but why is this leper begging at the sidewalk of a very rich part of the city? Because this rich man was not living in the hood. This rich man was living in the Beverly Hills of the city. Does that make sense? Like, like the nicer part of the city. And so here is this leper in front of this rich man's house. And it's kind of interesting, out of all the parables that Jesus taught, this is the only parable that he personalizes and names the main character. His name is Lazarus. Have you ever heard of Lazarus before, like the real Lazarus? There's a real Lazarus in the Bible that Jesus knew. This real Lazarus lived in a town called Bethany, right outside of Jerusalem, had some siblings named Mary and Martha. And they lived in a house in Bethany, and we believe that Jesus would go to this house periodically on vacation. That he was friends with Lazarus and Mary and and Martha. And Lazarus one day gets sick and dies as Jesus is a day's walk away. And so this whole story of Jesus coming back into Bethany and raising Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth Lazarus. You ever heard this story before? Well, this is interesting. The only parable that Jesus names the main character He names the main character after a real person named Lazarus, who's most likely Jesus' best friend, who's not a disciple. It's just kind of interesting. He's personalizing this poor man. Why? Well, we're going to learn about that in a moment. It talks about here that uh, the story goes on. Jesus says, the poor man died, meaning Lazarus died, and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. Meaning he goes to heaven and Abraham, Father Abraham, is already there, right? The rich man also died and was buried in Hades. So the rich man dies and goes to hell. Being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. This is very interesting. Jesus is forecasting something here. I mean, you know, when you read the stories of Jesus, you gotta kind of like read into them. What is Jesus saying here? Is Jesus saying that someday, someday for those people that go to a Christless eternity, to go to hell, are they gonna be able to see what's going on in heaven for all eternity and realize what they missed out on because they didn't accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior? That's a sobering thought. But Jesus makes it sound like that someday in eternity, we're going to be able to see in both sides. We're going to be able to see into heaven. We're going to be able to see into hell. I mean, honestly, this is kind of mind-boggling. It's a little, it's a little disturbing, right? I mean, if, if we're just going to be honest, this is a very sobering moment here. Again, the people listening to Jesus are probably going, whoa, this is heavy, this is deep. And then Jesus goes on to say that the rich man calls out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus. Now think about this. The rich man is saying, send the poor leper that was on the outside of my property that laid there day after day after day that is now in heaven. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, child, Remember that you in your lifetime received good things, your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish, and besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. So Abraham says to the rich man, I'm sorry, There is a chasm, there's a distance that has now been fixed between us and we can't go in between. And I think it's just kind of interesting because Jesus is basically saying that while alive, the rich man chose distance, but now that they are both dead, there is a distance that has been chosen for them. That there is no way for them to go in between. So the rich man then responds and says, then... 
I beg you, Father, to send him, meaning Lazarus, to my father's house. In other words, come back to life. For I have five brothers so that he may warn them lest they also come into this place of torment. So here is the rich man going, please send Lazarus back to, to, to warn my siblings, my five, my five brothers. Now this moment, the people listening to Jesus are really squirming. And we don't understand why, because we live in America 2,000 years later. But I want to unpack this story because it's very interesting. Remember how I told you that only the super rich or the elite wore purple in Jesus' day, right? Well, it says at the beginning here, Jesus says that this rich man wears purple. Well, one of the people that would have worn purple in Jerusalem in Jesus' day is the high priest of Jerusalem, the one who basically was in charge of all of, you know, Judaism for Israel, the high priest would have worn purple. His name in Jesus' day was Caiaphas. Now, some of you recognize the name Caiaphas because every Easter we talk about him. Caiaphas was the high priest who had Jesus arrested, tortured, crucified. Caiaphas was the one who actually orchestrated all of this, and Caiaphas would have had a purple garment. I just think it's kind of interesting because Jesus, being God and man, remember Jesus was not just a man, he was also God, being God and man, knew that in the future, Caiaphas, the high priest who wore purple, was going to have him crucified. You want to guess how many brothers Caiaphas had in real life? Five. <laughs> what is Jesus saying here? Could the rich man in Jesus' parable, who wore purple, who had five brothers, could the rich man be a metaphor or a symbol of a real man by the name of Caiaphas, who was the head of the religious institution of the day? I don't know. Could Jesus be firing a shot over the bow here? I don't know. But if I'm a betting man, I would say yes. Jesus is sending a signal. I mean, the people listening to the story are getting really uncomfortable because what they're hearing is the person who is in charge of their religion is in Jesus' story going to hell. <laughs> they didn't crucify Jesus because he was a life coach that told them to go after their dreams. They crucified Jesus 2,000 years ago because he was turning everything upside down. And I will tell you that today, Jesus still is turning everything upside down. So at this point, Jesus continues, says this, but Abraham said in this story, they have Moses and the prophets, let them, let them hear them. In other words, he's saying to the rich man, he's like, hey, listen, they have Moses and the prophets. They have all the Old Testament. They have all the prophecies. They have all the teachings. And then the rich man says, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses, meaning Abraham says, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? He is sitting there going, oh no, guess what? If someone dies and comes back to life, there are still some religious people that are not going to believe. There's still some people that are going to deny that miracle. Who is going to die in real life and come back to real life? Jesus. Jesus is forecasting this. And you know what happened? Literally, if you fast forward, Jesus dies on Good Friday. He resurrects on what we call Easter Sunday. And there were some guards, some Roman guards that were positioned at the tomb on Easter Sunday morning that when the, the stone was rolled away, they like were blown back, literally physically blown back. I mean, like, like it was a moment where the angels did this. I mean, it was crazy. You know what that Caiaphas did 
If you read not only in, um, in biblical history, like in, in the Gospels, but also there are some historical accounts of this that are non-Christian accounts, that, that Caiaphas basically brought in the guards that were guarding the tomb and bribed them with money and said, don't tell this story of what happened. Instead, spread word that Jesus' disciples stole his body. So guess what? Even the man in purple, who had five brothers, who saw Jesus come back to life, heard the story, saw the empty tomb, did not believe. Do you know some people can have a miracle happen right in the middle of their life and they still won't give God the credit? Isn't that true? Isn't that true? So here's my question today. It's a heavy question. I know today, I told you you had to tuck your feet back, right? Right? I told you, okay? Jesus is stepping on some toes. But here's my question for all of us today, whether we're sitting in our living room today or one of our city first locations, why is the rich man in hell? In Jesus' story, why? Because I gave you background. Like I talked about Caiaphas and the five brothers and I, I, I talked about the purple garments and all that kinds. But if you just read the story, only the story, Jesus, he doesn't have a tone here where he paints the rich man as being this ultra evil guy. He doesn't do that. He just tells the story. And you know, I, I one time had a prof in, in seminary say this to me. If Jesus' stories always make sense, you're not reading them correctly. And it's really true. So this doesn't make sense. Why is the rich man in hell? Is, is he in hell because he has a lot of money? No. No. There is literally nothing wrong with having a lot of money. There's nothing wrong with being rich. There's nothing wrong, in this case, with being super rich. That, that money doesn't send you to hell. I mean, I know some of you have heard, you know, that the root of all evil is money. That's actually a misquote of the Bible. That's not what the Bible says. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. So it is okay if you have money, just as long as money doesn't have you. All right? So, so listen, he doesn't go to hell because he's rich. Does he go to hell because he has nice clothes, lives in a big house? No, no. In fact, Jesus actually tells a story where this rich man does what a lot of people, whether they're rich or not, would not do. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Because at the beginning of the story, Jesus says the rich man allowed Lazarus, the poor man, to lay at his gate in most likely a very nice neighborhood. So again, let me just ask a really uncomfortable question. What would you do if a homeless person that had a highly contagious disease, decided to live at the end of your sidewalk. What would you do? <laughs> See, no one wants to breathe right now. Because <laughs> we're all like, oh. Like, would you call the cops? What would you do? Well, this rich man allows it to happen. Allows this Lazarus in Jesus' story to live there. And we get the impression it's not just for a day, or it's not just for a week. It's for a long time. Why? Because the dogs come and lick his sores. Now, some of you are like, well, those are like street animals, right? Well, actually, back in Jesus' day, I mean, they could be street animals. We don't know. But in, back in Jesus' day, if you were rich, you owned guard dogs. So that means, let's just pretend that it's the guard dogs the guard dogs had become so familiar with Lazarus that they're kind of like nudging up next to him and licking his sores and hanging out with him. It means that Lazarus was probably there for a long time. And if you're a rich person, you're hosting dinner parties and you're having guests. And what happens when your di dinner party guests are coming over and to get through the gate, they have to climb over a contagious leper? Think about this. And, and so they come in and they're probably like looking at the rich man and they're like, hey, John, you probably should do something about the homeless guy at the end of your property. And what does the rich man say? That's all right. He's not hurting anybody. In fact, Jesus even says that every day that the rich man has scraps or leftovers from his table sent out to Lazarus so he has something to eat. See, this rich man is not like evil. 
I mean, scraps from the table of this type of a rich person, these scraps, I mean, I'm telling you, the chefs that served the rich people of that day were the best chefs in the world. So guess what? Lazarus is feasting off of some very amazing scraps. So I'll ask the question again. Why is the rich man in hell? Why is the rich man in hell? <laughs> I mean, this, this, is, this is a question that I had to ask myself. And honestly, a lot of people have had to ask throughout the millennia. It's like, Jesus, why? I don't, I don't get it. Why is, why is the rich man in hell and Lazarus goes to heaven and, and all this? Well, here's what I know. I know this, that Jesus has a message for us inside of this parable something that we even in 2021 can take away today. And maybe, maybe this is what Jesus is trying to communicate. Most people like to help those that are marginalized, but they don't want a relationship with them. It's easier to write a check than it is to strike up a conversation. It's easier to say, oh yeah, I'll help those people over there but the gate is closed and so could Jesus be saying that it isn't just about good works but good works have to be connected to a heart of compassion and maybe this is the reason why Jesus is telling the story that is pretty intense, and he's basically saying, here is this rich person who is doing all of the actions of compassion, but the heart is far from those whom he is being compassionate to. And now pointing back to the religious leader of the day, could he be communicating, hey Caiaphas, you're doing all the religious stuff but yet your heart is not connected. <laughs> I mean, right? There was a missionary in India by the name of Amy Carmichael, and she coined a, a very famous saying now. In fact, many people have said it, but she was the one that first penned it. She said this, that you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. It's a really powerful truth. Maybe this is the reason why the rich man is in hell. I don't know. You know, in Jesus' day too, if you were poor and if you were sick, like you had a disease, people thought that God was judging you. That's what they really believed. Like now we look at it and we kind of go, that doesn't make any sense. But, but back in Jesus' day, if you were poor or if you were sick, like you had a disease, People would avoid you, not just because of the disease, but they would avoid you because they thought that God was cursing you. So guess what the religious people did of that day? Stayed away. This is why when Jesus tells another famous story, parable, the Good Samaritan, you all heard that one? What did the high priest or the first person on the path that encountered the man that was beat up, what did that person do? walked around. Why? Because evidently, if that person was beat up, they were judged by God and they were left for dead. You couldn't touch a dead body because again, it was all this religious stuff of the day. Jesus is turning it all on its head. And you know, I'm thinking in 2020, maybe God is asking us to have a better relationship with those that are marginalized, those that are outcast, those that are under-resourced. And, and, and this is the thing. I'm not just talking, I'm not just talking poor, quote unquote, poor people, but people that are on the outside of your gate. Who in your life makes you feel uncomfortable? <laughs> right? Like people that are on the outside. Could, could Jesus be sending a signal to not only the people listening to him, but also Caiaphas, the, the religious leader of that day, that guess what? If someone's poor or marginalized or, or, or they're you know, sick, that doesn't mean God's judging them. We live in a hopelessly broken world, and we're supposed to have relationship. So here, here's the question. 
Who's on the outside of your gate? Who's on the outside? Like, I mean, come on, in the workplace, who's that person, right? That maybe they're in your world, but they're, they're locked out. Or, or at school, I, I, you know, got our amazing bunch of youth right here in the center section, and I love that they sit up front. I love that. And, um, <laughs> and I know school, school's kind of over now, you know, we're on summer break. Um, but think about this for those of you that are in school who's that one kid that is at school that looks a little different and acts a little different and is a little different and everyone makes fun of them and no one wants to really get close to them see maybe that's our Lazarus or, or who is hurting who's rejected in your world Who's the one that, again, is marginalized in one way or the other? And, and, and this is what I think Jesus would ask us this morning. Will you open your gate? Will you open your gate? And here's the reason why. Closeness brings clarity. And as long as they're distant, there's a distorted view of them. But when you get up close and you hear somebody's story, then all of a sudden, you start realizing that maybe it's a little bit different than what you thought. Because your opinion of them may change as you eliminate the distance. Because distance definitely creates distortion. We need close proximity to those that are marginalized. Not just because we can help to some degree. But guess what? I think Jesus always wants us to have a relationship with those that are marginalized because that relationship changes our heart too. In fact, I would say this. This is, I would say that when you engage in a friendship or a conversation or you eliminate distance between you and a person who's on the outside, not only do they benefit, but actually you may benefit more. I was talking to a friend who just a few weeks ago said that he was downtown Rockford and there was a homeless person right outside of his office. And instead of walking past him, he stopped and had a conversation, found out the guy was in the trades and during like COVID for one reason or another lost his job so he's newly homeless. He's lost everything just within the last six months. And all of a sudden, my friend told me that his preconceived idea of that man changed after a 15-minute conversation. See, distance creates distortion. And maybe the simple, simple, simple truth that Jesus is powerfully communicating through this complex story is that we are to open our gates. Take time. Take time to hear other people's stories, to get to know those people that are in our sphere of influence who are on the outside, whatever outside is. Again, it's not necessarily socially, economic kind of outside. It could be but they're outside, they're rejected, they're marginalized. Take time to open your gate because then, guess what? You're not just giving without love, but because of love, you are giving. Does that make sense? Of your time, of your space, of your heart, and maybe of your resource. So let's pray. Lord, I just thank you thank you, Lord Jesus, that this story makes us pause. It makes us think. And hopefully even tomorrow, it will make us live a little different. God, we want to have connection with those people who are the least of these, like the Bible talks about. Lord, you said this. You said in Matthew, when I was in prison, you visited me. When I was hungry, you fed me. 
when I was naked, you clothed me. So where you show up is when we have a relationship with those that are marginalized. We open up our gate and we're willing to not just send our resource, but Lord, we are the resource, our friendship, our relationship. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to do that. Give us opportunities. Give us courage. Lord, melt away our pride. And Lord, in these moments that we engage those that are on the other side of our gate, may it change us. May it change us. Meet us in that space wherever two or three are gathered. Meet us in that space, I pray. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Come on, let's give God praise. Can we do that?